Hi everybody, we know that the macro objective for unemployment is low unemployment, or more precisely, full employment. So if unemployment is greater than what we would like it to be in the economy, we need to bring that down via the use of macro policies. But which policies? Well, that depends on the type of unemployment that is most prevalent. So in this video, we're gonna look at all the different types of unemployment again and target their reduction via the use of macro policies. We're gonna start by looking at cyclical unemployment. Remember that cyclical unemployment occurs in a recession when aggregate demand is very low and therefore we see unemployment that comes from it. So therefore, if we want to reduce cyclical unemployment, we need to try and boost AD. Well, we can use expansionary demand side policies to do that, either expansionary fiscal policy or expansionary monetary policy. So expansionary fiscal policy could be increasing government spending or reducing taxation like income tax or corporation tax. Expansionary monetary policy could be a reduction in interest rates. And if these policies work, then aggregate demand would shift to the right as we see here and with that we get economic growth, but because labor is a derived demand, more employment is created and that can bring down cyclical unemployment. But are there issues with using these policies? Yeah, let's evaluate them. There is a risk of a conflict of macro objectives. We can see that, yeah, we might be able to increase growth and bring cyclical unemployment down, but there could be demand pull inflation that overshoots the target as a side effect. At the same time, if growth increases and incomes are rising in the economy, that could worsen a current account deficit if we see more sucking in of imports, more spending on imports by households. Expansionary fiscal policy could worsen government finances. We've learned what the problems are with that when it comes to funding in the long term. Uh, a lot of these policies are reliant on strong consumer and business confidence, especially our direct tax cuts and our interest rate cuts. But in a recession, we could argue that confidence is likely to be low, both consumer and business confidence, limiting the effectiveness of these policies and boosting AD, and therefore bringing cyclical unemployment down. And also there are time lags associated with these policies as well. But what if the type of unemployment prevalent is not cyclical? What if it's real wage unemployment? Well, remember that real wage unemployment occurs when wages in the labor markets are forced above equilibrium, and that creates an excess supply of labor. The difference between QS and QD on this diagram represents the real wage or classical unemployment, in which case we need policies that can bring down the wage rate towards equilibrium in the labor market. And that could be reducing minimum wages, it could be reducing the strength of trade unions. Both of these policies, in theory, ideally, will bring wages in the labor market towards equilibrium and therefore hopefully close that gap and bring employment towards equilibrium as well. But easy evaluation here is the strong negative impact on workers and their living standards and also the potential to drive up income inequality in the economy, which again we know is a conflict of macro objectives. But now let's move away from these two disequilibrium forms of unemployment and move into equilibrium types of unemployment, i.e. unemployments within the natural rate of unemployment, structural unemployment and frictional unemployment. What if these types of unemployment are very high and we want to bring those down? Well, these are supply side causes of unemployment and therefore we need targeted supply side policies in order to bring them down. Let's focus on structural unemployment first. Now remember that structural unemployment is about immobility of labor, the occupational immobility of labor and the geographical immobility of labor. So what we need are supply side policies that target the reductions in those immobilities. We have interventionist supply side policies and we have market based supply side policies we could use. Let's look at the interventionist supply side policies first. Well, we could increase government spending on education and training. That could be curriculum reform, that could be building new schools, that could be hiring more teachers or training up teachers more, it could be spending on adult training programs. But the idea here is that we are going to be boosting the skills of the workforce, improving productivity, thus bringing down the occupational immobility of labor. The government could offer subsidies to private firms to encourage more in-work training programs to make sure that workers, while they're in work, are still being skilled up so that they have transferable skills, whereby if ever they're made unemployed, they could easily transfer into vacancies in the economy, helping to reduce occupational immobility of labor. The government can spend more on transport infrastructure that can help to reduce geographical immobility of labor and allow workers to take vacancies that are maybe in towns and cities further away from where they're currently living, allowing commuting, for example. Also, the government could provide grants or maybe build and provide low cost housing to again encourage more geographical mobility of labor. So workers actually take job vacancies that are further away from where they are currently located. But also we can look at the market-based supply side policies. 
and see very differently how these policies could be used to again reduce the mobilities. We could have a reduction in benefits, pretty harsh, but it will provide a nudge, a very big incentive for workers either to skill themselves up and to make sure that they are suitable to take vacancies that are out there in the economy, thus reducing occupational immobility of labour. But also, it's going to reduce geographical immobility of labour. Workers can't be as picky and reject job vacancies in areas that they don't like very much. If benefits are low, they're going to be forced to take those jobs, knowing that they don't have the safety net of benefits to fall back on in that period of time where they're unemployed. So reducing benefits really forces workers to either skill up or to take vacancies in areas in the economy where vacancies exist, um, and knowing that they can't rely on benefits uh, instead. Also, uh, governments can deregulate hiring and firing laws. This is a very big policy that can reduce occupational immobility of labour because now workers would have an incentive to hire the low-skilled workers, knowing they can pay them a low wage, but hopefully train them up into very productive workers for that firm, knowing that if that doesn't happen, if the workers don't end up being great for the firm, they could fire them very easily. So by deregulating hiring and firing laws, uh, firms have got more of an incentive to hire the low-skilled, therefore reducing occupational immobility of labour. What about when it comes to frictional unemployment? Well, remember, frictional unemployment is the search uh, unemployment that exists when workers are between jobs. So workers have given up a job, they're looking for the next best job for themselves, where they can be more productive and more happy. The period that they are searching, they are frictionally unemployed. Well, again, we can use interventionist supply-side policies to reduce that search time. Pro uh, governments could spend more or they could um, provide better resources for job centres, whereby those who are unemployed and searching can go to job centres and they're more likely to find the exact vacancy thereafter. Job centres can help them better in finding the appropriate vacancies, the appropriate jobs for them. Or governments could go the other way and provide subsidies to private job agencies, whereby they've got better resources, they're more equipped to deal with more of the frictionally unemployed and providing the appropriate jobs for them that suit them very well. Or governments can spend on infrastructure, again, transport infrastructure, so that the frictionally unemployed have got a, a greater search radius whereby they can look for vacancies. And that, again, can help them reduce their search time, knowing there is a wider area of the economy that they can look for vacancies. Or we could go the market-based route, and we could, again, reduce benefits and basically force those who are unemployed looking for their next best job to be quicker, knowing that they don't have the safety net of benefits to fall back on in their search time, forcing them to be quicker. But these are all supply-side policies, guys, whether it's structural or frictional unemployment we're trying to reduce, and therefore we can use the same evaluation points against them. We know a lot of these policies aren't guaranteed to work, especially the interventionist policies are very costly, there are time lags associated, and the market-based supply-side policies have got some negative stakeholder impacts on workers themselves. So we can bear that in mind. But when it comes to overall evaluation of policies to reduce unemployment, we have to bear in mind the type of unemployment we are trying to reduce. We need targeted policies depending on the type, as we clearly see here. So that's fundamental. Also bear in mind that it's very difficult sometimes to isolate what type of unemployment is out of control and higher than we would like it to be. So really a range of these policies is desirable. But also we have to bear in mind that some types are worse than others. So for example, frictional unemployment is quite healthy for an economy, as long as it's not crazy out of control and crazy high. This is very healthy for workers to be looking for their next best job for a more productive workplace for them. Nothing wrong with that necessarily. Whereas types like structural unemployment do need fixing. And we also have to bear in mind that our target is for full employment. So if unemployment is at the natural rate, then maybe we don't need policies. Given the side effects that policies can cause, maybe we don't need policies to bring the unemployment rate down. That differs, though, if the natural rate of unemployment is very high in itself, in which case we need to bring that down, or if we have unemployment way beyond the natural rate, then we need to do something about it. So that covers, guys, all the policies we need to solve various types of unemployment. Thanks for watching. I'll see you all in the next video. Thank mm -hmm. you.